Hi, Stu Bamick here, Pauley's Island, South Carolina. Isn't it amazing that, that the same spirit that was present at creation, that created ex nihilo out of the very word of God, out of nothing, the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, isn't it amazing that that same power is available to you and to me to live within us, inside of us? I mean, if you're like me, I tend to operate on my own strength. I gave my life to Jesus as my Savior. I don't have to go to hell. But after that, I'm out here on my own, alone. I try to operate on my own power, my own strength. I, but I realize I don't really have what it takes. I need a new power, a supernatural power. And interestingly, that's exactly what God has given to you and to me. Throughout his ministry, Jesus spoke over and over and over again to his followers about his departure. He would tell them, I'm leaving. And this news shocked them and troubled them and puzzled them and confused them. Then, on the eve of his death, he met with his closest followers in an upper room and he announced, the hour has now come. It's time. I'm leaving. And this news shocked them. It left every one of them wondering what was going to happen next. They had left everything to follow Jesus. They had left their family, their home, their wives, their children, their career, their income, their reputation. You can't leave now. We've seen all this power, all this glory, the blind see, the lame walk. A, a little girl was brought back to life. You can't leave now. We just got this thing really rolling. But Jesus said to them, I'm leaving. But when I do, I'm going to ask my father to give you something, a gift, so great, so magnificent, so powerful, so extraordinary, that it would be better for me to leave so that you can receive this gift. And then, after his arrest, an unjust trial, a public execution, death, burial, there were reports that something strange happened out there at the tomb. He appeared alive, resurrected, and for 40 days he walked and talked and ate with people. And then, on one occasion, one occasion, while he was eating, he told his closest followers, go back, go back to Jerusalem and wait, wait. John baptized you with water, the sign of repentance, but I will baptize you in the Holy Spirit, the sign of a new power and a new purpose and a new age. We read in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, these words, but you, you, will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and, and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. What a crazy story. He tells his closest followers, you are going to receive a power a power, a supernatural power, the Holy Spirit power to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth forever, forever, through this supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. And after he said this, slowly, visibly, he was taken up into a cloud before their very eyes. He wanted them to know that he was gone for good. His saving mission was accomplished. He had gone to sit in session and rule at the right hand of the Father. All authority on heaven and earth was now his. He was taken up. No question, he was gone for good. He had left them. And so they returned to the upper room in Jerusalem, and they do what he told him to, them to do. They wait. Hour by hour, moment by moment, day by day, they wait in confusion, in wonder, in mystery. And then, 10 days later, God begins to move. And what happened was the last event in the history of salvation before his return. There's nothing else left to do than this event and the return of Jesus. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. Pentecost, the feast of the first fruits, the feast of the harvest. In the Greek, Pente, the 50th day. 50th day after what? The 50th day after the Passover, the day of atonement, the day that Jesus had died. The Yom Kippur. And, and on the day of, of this great feast of the Pentecost, all the Hebrews would gather from every single corner of the Mediterranean world. The population of Jerusalem would swell from 25,000 people to 125,000 people.
Here in Acts, we find the link from the cross to the resurrection to the ascension to Pentecost. So his closest followers are all together in the upper room. And they're talking, they're wondering, they're waiting. But on this Pentecost, something happened in that room that changed the course of history and your life and mine. Here it is, Acts chapter 2, verse 2. Suddenly, there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them, rested on each one of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. First thing that's happening here, a new power, the power of the Holy Spirit. They heard a sound like, like, that's, that's the term for a metaphor. It wasn't a, a, a mighty wind, a violent wind. Uh, we don't know how to describe it. Uh, we can't put it into real human terms, but it was like a violent wind. And, and, and when that rushing, roaring of that deafening wind came around, like a tornado, it filled the whole house. But there was no wind. And we saw something like fire that separated and divided and fell on every single one of us. This fire is the Shekinah glory, it's a theophany. It's the sign of the presence of God. Moses saw the Shekinah glory of God in a theophany, a God presence in the burning bush. It wasn't consumed, but it burned and burned and burned. It's the sign of the Holy Spirit. It's the sign of God's presence. It's a sign that something amazingly great is going to happen that should be recorded for all of history. And it falls on each and every single one of them. This thing that's like a fire in the midst of this roaring wind. We know now that the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was given to special people, uh, prophets and kings and, and judges, and people that had a special role to fulfill. It was uh, drinking like uh, lowering a bucket down into a well and drinking. It was just given to certain people. But in the New Testament, here we find in this upper room that the Holy Spirit is going to be poured out on all believers. Everyone. It's like a central water system. We can simply turn the water on and we can receive it. It can be a part of our lives. You see, Jesus ascends so that the Holy Spirit can descend. Pentecost is the inauguration of a new power, of the age of the Holy Spirit, of the pneuma, the spirit, the dunamis, the power, the paraclete, the advocate, the helper. It's a mighty wind that fills the whole house. It surrounds them. The tongues of fire rest on them. The fire fell upon them. It filled them with the Holy Spirit. The life-giving power, the breath of the Holy Spirit filled them. It was burned into them. And they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. I mean, this is crazy. Something's happening that never happened before in the history of the world that's going to redefine and reshape your life and mine. They are not alone. They are now receiving a power that's swirling around them like a mighty wind. Acts chapter 2 verse 5. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven, and at this sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native tongue? Not only a new power, but a new purpose to reveal, to tell the greatest story ever told. So what's happening here? Well, who are these devout men? The devout men are foreign-born Jews of every nation around the Mediterranean world. And, and their goal was at the end of their life to return to Jerusalem as, and take their family with them and live near the temple. So they're living there. They're older. They're living there. They come from everywhere. And when they heard the roar, the, this violent, mighty wind, they followed the sound to the place where the followers were gathered. It was a sign, head towards the upper room. And when they got there, they heard them speaking in languages of the Persians, of Asia Minor, of Mesopotamia, of Greece, of Rome, of Egypt, their own native languages. And they were amazed. They were astonished. So here's what they said. Are not these Galileans? How, how did they know that? Why, why did they say that? Because, because Galileans were easily identified with this guttural backwater dialect. They were 
illiterate, uneducated. And here, these foreign-born Jews who have gathered in Jerusalem hear these Galileans speaking in their own tongues in perfect syntax and language, the languages of the foreign nations in a way that is perfect. You see, at Pentecost, God entrusted the message of salvation to a group of uneducated, untrained Galileans. Now they have a new purpose in life. They have a new calling to live out, a new mission, and so do you and I. And, and that is to convey the message of Jesus Christ in a way that people could understand. Now, this is really critical in our contemporary world. Conveying the true story, the real story about Jesus Christ, the real great adventure to our culture in a way that it can understand. You, you know that I grew up in Young Life, many of you, and, and Jim Rayburn founded Young Life on three principles. One, every kid deserved the right to hear the real story about Jesus Christ. Everybody deserves that right. Every, every, everybody. We have to win the right to be heard to be able to tell them st that story. And when we tell them, he said, three, it's a sin to bore people with the greatest story ever told, the great adventure. And so he would take kids away from home out to Colorado or to Malibu in Canada and, and so they could experience the week of their lives. I have this unmitigated pleasure and joy while we're hearing God's great country to tell you the greatest story ever told. What a privilege. Well, how do we do this? H how do we tell people, the people around us? Well, we meet them on common ground, on common terms, on neutral turf. Where they live, we go out. We don't invite them to come in. We go out. And when we go out, we win the right to be heard. We care and we serve. And when the time is right, God's time, and we have a Holy Spirit to lead us and prompt us and guide us to when that time is right, we invite them to the right place. It might be a church service or a small group or to have dinner with some friends. And then we share our story of what God did in our lives and what happened to us and our understanding of who Jesus Christ really is. That's how it happens. That's what, how it works. They're telling these people the story of Jesus in their natural languages, in ways they can understand. Hey, you and I may be the closest that anyone gets to the real person of Jesus Christ. We represent him. And, and, and in, in representing him, we want to speak the language that the people understand. I'm going to be taking a trip next week to Athens, Greece. I will be standing on Mars Hill, where Paul stood, and he started exactly where the Greeks started when he was explaining the message of Christianity to them, and in, in, in where they lived and, and how they thought, to the Epicureans who were seeking pleasure and happiness, and to the Stoics who wanted to avoid pain and were tolerant of all people. Remind us of our present day time, right? Yeah, Paul was speaking to people just like our present time. And, and he started right where they could understand it with their gods and then moved his way outward after living with those people into who the God of Christianity really is. And only the Holy Spirit can do that. We cannot do it on our own. We can only do it in the power of the Holy Spirit, which they receive here and now to share with a new purpose, the real story of Jesus Christ in a language that people can understand. So not only do they have a new power and a new purpose, but catch this, they're living in a new age, the age of the Holy Spirit, the last of the days, the days that the prophets long to live in, and they're living in it. It's the start, the inauguration of the new age, and we live in it as well. You see, what happened in Jerusalem that day was the Holy Spirit showed up, and it fell on a small group of followers of believers. And when it did, they began to tell the greatest story ever told, and it spread like wildfire. We read in Acts 10, then, that Peter is living in a, a, a Gentile world, in a Gentile household, and God tells him that the gospel is not just for the Jews, but it's for everybody. There's a Gentile Pentecost there in Caesarea, that he has a great story to tell for all people, not just the Jewish people, not just the Hebrews, the chosen people, but all people at all times and all places. The Holy Spirit is unleashed into the whole world. 
At that moment in redemptive history, God releases a power, the power of the Holy Spirit on every believer. And that release of that power, that creation power, that resurrection power, is as real today in our lives as it was in that upper room 2,000 years ago. And it spread like wildfire throughout the whole world. This is our great challenge. The great challenge of our age is not political or economic or educational or scientific or technological or AI, uh, which is they say is bigger than the invention of fire electricity. No, that, that's not the great challenge of our age. The great challenge of our age is the challenge of changing the human spirit, the human heart, and only God can do that through the power, the anointing power of the Holy Spirit working through you and me in other people. Hey, what's the great challenge of our age, it's not just revival, which is local, a group of local people get really on fire for Jesus. It's not renewal, which is regional. It is an awakening where a nation turns away from the things that are not of God, and they turn towards the things of God. And that happens in the last days. We have a new power, a new purpose, and a new age. And we, you and I, get to live in it. The answer for our age, you want to pray for something, pray for an awakening of God's Holy Spirit in our culture and our lives and our country today. So, for their day and our day, there is a new power. There's a new power. There's the anointing power of the Holy Spirit, a resurrection power. Only by the power of the Holy Spirit can we do what we can't do, speak what we can't speak, change what we can't change. Only through the power, the creative power of the universe of the Holy Spirit, a new power. There is a new purpose. It is the final age. The final age has begun. It's here. This is prophetic. We live in it. We are it. It is the day that Abraham and Moses and David longed for. This is the bottom of the ninth with two outs in the seventh game of the World Series. And guess what? For some reason, we get to play. For some reason, God chose you and me to live in the last days. He could have chosen us to live in the days of Abraham, or he could have chosen to live in the days of Ezekiel or Isaiah, or even in the days of Jesus, but he didn't. He chose us to live in the last days, the last days, and we get to play in the game. A new power, a new purpose, and a new age. You know where we live? We live in this new age, and, and we have the unspeakable privilege and calling of the last age, the age of the Holy Spirit. There's God the Father, the Creator, God the Son, the Savior, and God the Holy Spirit, the Advocate, the Helper, the Revealer, the one who gives us power to take God's message and translate it into the language of the culture and the people that we live in. I want to tell you one thing. I want to leave with one last thing. Hell is hot, the stakes are high, and the time is short. Hell is hot, stakes are high, and the time is short. It's our role to pass on the baton, the legacy of historic Christianity to the next generation. So let's get going. Let's get in the game. Receive the power of the Holy Spirit so you can perceive your purpose in life and you can live in these the last of the days. Hey friends, we live together in the last of the days, of the last age. Let's get together. In my last message, I said, let's wait, let's be together, unified, and let's pray. And let's get this Holy Spirit and allow it, release it to fall on you and me. Hey, get connected with us at Consequential Christianity. Go to our website, consequentialchristianity.com and hit the sign up button, type in your email address. But more importantly, if you're already on there, pass that message, that email address. Ask a friend, hey, would you like to get some short messages every single week that I think you might enjoy? Pass those along to people. And if you'd like to support us or help us, you can do that by, by uh, getting in touch with us at uh, Consequential Christianity, Post Office Box 805, Pauley's Island, South Carolina, 29585. Hey, we live in the last of the days. Hell is hot, the stakes are high, and the time is short. Let's get in the game.